Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. In, uh, interviews with people who have special insights into education from preschool all the way to higher education. I'm Jim Sean, I'm your host, and today we have a special guest who's spent really a, a professional lifetime in education administration as principal of several schools. Catherine Payne, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you. Yeah. And so uh, you are maybe best known of recent years of being principal of Farrington High School, but when you were a little girl, did you say, Mommy, I want to be a principal, or uh, <laughs> how did you get into this? Well, not when I was, I didn't want to be a principal, but I always wanted to be a teacher from the time I was very, very young. Uh -huh. I gathered little children in the neighborhood around me and taught them to read and oh. had summer fun before there was summer fun with the neighborhood children, and I just always knew I would be a teacher, and I was for uh, 10 years. I was a teacher um, along the Waianae Coast at Mount Akuli High in intermediate school. And what did you teach? I taught English and a few other things too. I taught social, some social studies. I taught, um, I was the student activities coordinator. When you're in a small school, you do lots of things, but English was my primary as assignment. So that was a challenge, that's a challenging, notoriously at least, challenging area of, of the islands where social economic. Uh, challenges are very prominent. Do you have any? Certainly um, that's true. Um, what I found though is that it was just a, a wonderful place for me to get grounded in my own philosophy about what is important in education. I found the students and the families um, and the colleagues there to be just uh, wonderful people that supported me and um, I loved every minute of my time there. Great. Um, so um, education has changed a lot since you, you got involved. In the last 20, 30 years, there have been so many changes. You want to talk a little bit about how public ed, you know, was when you entered it and what you see now? Well, I think, you know, there's been a lot of, of social changes and there have been a lot of um, political change. The basic relationship between children and students in the class, or teachers and, and students in the uh, classroom hasn't really changed that much because that's still the key element of success for children. Um, but we've been going through lots of changes um, in systems in education. And I think back when I was a teacher, it was the Nation at Risk that came yes. out that I think maybe first started that whole movement that we have continued in about our public schools are failing, we have to do so much more um, to improve them, and the politicians really got into education at that point, I think, and we've, we're still there. Well, politicians have often been involved with uh, boards of education, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it, it has always been, seems to me, very political in the sense that everyone can play that tape in their mind of their own education and, and believe they know education yes. as a result of that. I, I think that's, that's the com everyone has that common experience that we don't have with um, the medical profession or the legal profession. So not everybody thinks they know how to do those jobs, but everybody thinks they know how to tell teachers how to do their job, I think, because we've been there. So when you were a teacher, you must have observed administrators, principals, and others, and did you kind of come away with, well, that's a good trait, and that one didn't work too well? Oh, absolutely. I think it, even uh, I observe other teachers, and as a young teacher, I, I knew who I wanted to be like. I started out as a substitute, so I substituted for a year, and that's a great opportunity to kind of say, I want to be like this one, I don't want to be like that one. and. Um, and certainly the same with leaders. You, you're watching them all the time, just as children watch us. So oh. people need to be aware that they are constantly role models, whether they like it or not. Yeah. Do, do you think that um, it takes uh, also special training to move from teacher to administrator to principal? I think it takes training, but it also takes um, sort of an internal um, desire to move forward and take on more responsibility. And I think as a leader myself, one of the things I was always looking for 
were individuals who had something more that they could offer, and then how could I nurture that? So I was very lucky because I had principals who did that for me, mm -hmm. and who, um, it was the principal who came to me and said, I think you should consider the administrative program. Mm -hmm. And it was not something I had been thinking of. I thought maybe I would become a, more of a teacher leader. I had you know, taken on more responsibilities at the school, but I never thought of myself as a principal until my principal said, you need to start thinking about this. And so that was a great gift to me, and so I tried to do that myself for others. So where, were, where was your first principalship? My first principalship was at Olamana School. I did two years as a vice principal at Waianae High, and mm -hmm. then I went to Olamana, which is still kind of a mystery to a lot of people. I got an award there for being principal at Olamana Elementary from the Department of Education because apparently they didn't know it was not an elementary school. It's the school inside the youth corrections, yes, and okay. it's also an alternative high school detention home, and at the time also the state hospital. Mm -hmm. So I stayed there for nine years, and it was just an extension of what I learned at Nanakuli about young people who are considered to be um, not as worthwhile to invest in, you know, I think, and, and my commitment was to really turn that institution into a school that was um, respectful of the students who were there and gave them options beyond the, the real um, negative experiences they'd had in education and in life up to that point. Mm -hmm. And did those students stay in that school uh, for their entire education? It's a very transient population, and the schools are separate. So you have the school for the incarcerated youth. Yeah. You have the alternative high school, which is 7 to 12. And those students are referred from their home schools. Some of them go back. Some of them stay the whole time. Uh -huh. But the um, incarcerated population, the detention home population, is very, very transient. Mm -hmm. So when you first became a principal, it must have been things that landed on your desk and tasks that you said, well, I didn't know this was coming. You know? <laughs> I think um, that's true. I think what I didn't realize was how um, bureaucratic organizations could be even outside of the DOE. And so that was a good lesson for me. When I went to Olamana, you work with the Department of Health very closely. You work with, at that time, Department of Corrections, Public Safety, in addition to education and the judiciary. So I had four big agencies that I had to navigate through and, and find, build relationships really. It's a lot about building relationships and getting the trust of people who I needed to help me support the kids. So you, you were, you, you got a much broader kind of orientation, indoctrination in other organizations before you went into the DOE per se. Yeah. That really helped a lot because I think when you're in leadership roles, um, the bigger picture understanding you have of the large government that you work in, the more effective you can be. And the more you know of people who are working in these key positions outside of the department that can support what you're doing, the better. And that really helped me. Those nine years at Olamana, um, helped me very much to, to do the job I did at Farrington, because mm -hmm. I knew lots of people when I moved on. So you went from Olamana to Farrington? Yep. So those were just my four schools in my 37 years, mm -hmm. and I was at Farrington for the last 15 years of my career. So Farrington has, uh, in recent years, had a lot of immigrants coming. Farrington has a lot of immigrants. Um, it's just the nature of the community. It's where it's sort of the first stop for many of the newly arrived immigrants. Um, we had in our second language program at the time I was there, in a population of about 2,500 kids, we had um, s between six and 800 um, students in the ELL program, wow, that's, which is a lot. That's uh, a huge amount. Yeah. Yes. But many, many of them went through that program to great success, uh -huh, including uh -huh. being valedictorian, some of them. Mm -hmm. We had some of our valedictorians started out in the ELL program. So. But you're not talking about just one other language. Oh, group. no. You're no. talking and, about it. And, and as the years went by, you know, new immigrant groups come in. We had, you know, the Pacific Islander groups, the Micronesian groups, and there are many languages there. The largest group of uh, immigrants at Philip, uh, were the Filipinos mm -hmm. at Farrington, and there are several languages even within that, uh, that culture. And so the struggle was always to find people who could work 
for Farrington, you know, and help with the translations, of, especially with the brand new students who are just coming in, and help pr not as much with the students and the translation there, but with the families, with the parents, so that they would understand what their role would be as parents. Uh, wow, Farrington might have got the brunt of newcomers. It's interesting uh, that statistically, one out of four uh, students in our system say they speak something other than English at home, yes. which is an astounding number. It seems to me, 25 percent, 26 percent. That that's huge, and I think even greater than that is they may speak another language at home. They may speak English at home, but their parents may not speak English even. Yes. So, you know, it may be even a bigger statistic than that as far as what we needed to do and what all of our schools need to do in reaching out to parents. Because that's always one of the things that we, we know is key to children's success is that school communication with parents and the support that is there. But when you have parents who are very hesitant to participate with the school because one, they have no idea how to um, navigate through our bureaucratic systems and or maybe even they speak English but they've had bad experiences themselves as students in the school you know so it's not um, when you're not working in your traditional middle class and upper middle class communities there are other things that you need to do to accommodate the community you're with you cannot just go in and say this is how we do things and they need to accommodate to us you have to change the way you do your work I know that statistically for many years, on average, Hawaii schools were almost twice as large in terms of enrollment as the average on the mainland. So with 500 students in a class, you know, freshmen, sophomore, that's a huge community just sitting there in one little campus. Yes. Well, it is, and I think one of the things we, we do know through research is that smaller is better, smaller class size and smaller schools, and at one time the Board of Education even had a policy that said that all new schools, new elementary schools, and they had a cap on the size and new middle schools and new high schools, and um, I think the high schools were like maybe 1,200 and the elementary, very much smaller than yes, we yes. actually are. And I, I don't know if they got rid of that policy. Probably they did because they've been cleaning up the obsolete policies, but they never followed it. If it just yes. is, it never seemed something they could reasonably do with the growth of the communities where they're having to build new schools. Right now, our schools on the west side are approaching 3,000. And Cam Campbell, may, the high schools, yeah. Campbell may be over that already. And it's not reasonable to expect um, the campuses just to continue to grow and grow. Yet we have no school under construction, no mm -hmm. high school under construction, but more elementary and middle have grown out there. It's very, very hard. Yes, getting lost in the, in the crowd and, you know, I, I remember reading of someone, some young boy who was, I guess, arrested in a parking lot in high school, and no one at the school knew whether or not he was a student at the school. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, and I think it is possible. One of the things that we did at Farrington, and I know that some of the other high schools have um, also started to do this, is to break the high school down into smaller academies, because we did recognize that um, all students need to feel some affiliation with something in the school that belongs to them. We, you know, ROTC is one example where kids really bond there, and, and some of the other programs if they're in athletics, but for most kids, they just kind of drift and they go to classes. But um, now every student at Farrington is in an academy, and it's a career-focused academy where they, around a theme, so they have a Law and Justice Academy, for example, where they, they have forensic science, the new building that was first opened, had a they put in a forensic science laboratory so that we could accommodate that curriculum. Um, so, yeah, very important. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, we are talking with Catherine Payne, former uh, specifically about her experiences at Farrington High School as principal, and we're going to get into her chairmanship of the Charter Commission, a completely different system. Uh, we'll be back in one minute. Okay, this is Think Tech Hawaii, and it's Wednesday. Every Wednesday is Energy Wednesday here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. 
4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. Come and listen to us. And just to show you what I mean, I'm going to ask Sharon to tell us more. Come and see us every Wednesday, as Jay said. And we have people like Jim Albers from HECO here and co-host Ray Starling here every Wednesday. We not only go on Olelo and OC16, but also stream live. So please come visit us, hear about the latest in clean energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here. You got any comment on all this? As important as energy is in all of our lives today, this is a great forum and a great format to vet those issues. So I encourage everybody to listen in and participate. Okay, Ray, what do you think for a close? Well, I, I think this is the greatest show uh, in the energy world here in Hawaii. Uh, you can come here every week, one hour, and catch the latest on what's happening and hear from the people who really know what's going on. Uh, like Jim Alberts, we appreciate your coming today. Thank you. Ray Starling, Sharon Moriwaki, Jim Alberts, and Jay Fidel here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Aloha. 4 to 5 p.m. Wednesday. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. We're talking with Catherine Payne, who spent a number of interesting years at Farrington High School as the principal. We were talking about how to divide that, that school into smaller parts, or intimate parts, I guess. And, and you were saying that now all the students are part of some kind of a school within the school yes. academy. Yes, and I think um, that has really helped to make students connect what they're learning to their future. Mm -hmm. And each academy has a connection with higher education, too. So there's a continuum of um, educational support for the students. Now, one of the things that I remember, there were some discussions, and we're going to transition into your new role as chair of the Charter Commission, was that whole idea whether or not you could have a charter school within a DOE campus. Uh, and, and so uh, thinking about the DOE system as you know it very well, and now this charter system, can you share with us some of the similarities and differences that you're seeing? Well, I think it's important to always say that the charter schools are public schools. So they're available to any student in the state that would like to attend them. Um, and we have sort of two tracks of charter schools. We have the schools that converted from regular DOE schools, and they do have to take the students in their um, geographic area. Um, but then we also have a number of schools, um, the majority now that are startups, that are brand new schools that are community-based uh, startup schools or theme thematically based, some of them. Um, but they're still public schools, and they cannot select the students who go to them. The, Anybody who is the right age um, can go. If the school can say, you know, we're, we teach in Hawaiian, <laughs> so it would be very helpful if you know Hawaiian, but they cannot restrict their admissions to uh -huh. students who are not Hawaiian. And, and about half of the schools are Hawaiian culture focused. They're either Hawaiian immersion for language and yes. culture or they're culture focused. Yes, yes. yes. And it does seem that. Uh, this, the appetite to create charters grew more rapidly on the neighbor islands. That's very true. Um, the Big Island is, yeah. uh, is really has a lot of charter schools and a lot of diverse schools, you know, and I did not know very much about charter schools until I was asked to get on this commission, and so it's been a learning curve for me because one of the things that is, has been true is that the charters were not fully embraced by the Department of Education initially, and um, even as, as public school administrators, we didn't do too much to reach out to the charters and include them in anything that we were doing. Um, that's changing now, and I think the department, there's been a lot of work to try to um, build some bridges with the department and to help them, for example, when they have professional development, because the charter schools still have to go through all the same race to the top stuff that everybody else does without the same resources. And so um, including our charter school teachers and leaders in training, for example, mm -hmm. is, is now moving forward a little bit more. And just to clarify for any uh, watchers who don't know that much about charters, they are public, publicly funded, no tuition public employees through collective bargaining. 
the same standards, the same tests, uh, but with a longer leash, shall we say. Yeah. So they have to do all that, and then they have to do more, because if you are um, working around a particular mission, then you want to add things into your curriculum beyond what is minimally required by the department. So mm -hmm. the charters, um, I've been very impressed by the work that they're doing. Um, we have some amazing um, um, entrepreneurs who are all school leaders because you really have to be, um, you have to find other funding. The state funding mm -hmm. is not adequate. And so our charter schools have sort of a nonprofit that works alongside of them. Um, where if they need to build a building, it has to go through the nonprofit. And that's probably the biggest challenge for our charters is finding facilities, um, either to rent or um, some of them actually have been able to con do construction. Yes, and uh, many may not realize, but through the contracts, the one really non-negotiable part is the salaries. Yes. So uh, a teacher at a charter is going to have to be paid the same amount as somewhere else. Uh, that's a really inflexible... That, uh, that is, um, and we are the only state that has our charter school teachers in the union. Um, I don't think this is a bad thing, though, in my opinion. And one of the things that it has done is it has kept the for-profit companies that like to come into places and use state money and mm -hmm. build schools um, out because they do not want to hire uh, people who are in the union. Um, I think this is probably a good thing because our charter schools in Hawaii, um, what makes one of the things that makes us unique is they really have been a grassroots effort to start yes. them up. But the funding, and because so much of it does have to go to pay their staff, they are limited unless they have um, some other way of bringing in resources, and some have been very, very creative. Commitment Schools has been a tremendous support, as has OHA, to our um, charter schools that have the Hawaiian focus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, um, you know, uh, some people say, or will ask the question, are charters successful? Uh, but it's sort of like small businesses, right? Because they're all so autonomous from each other, really, it's not really a system. Um, you know, it's, would you ask the question, are small businesses successful? Well, some aren't, yes. and some aren't, yes. right? Yes. But one of the key elements to this, it seems to me, which you bring to the table in particular, is what are the duties and the tasks and the challenges of a DOE principal versus a charter school director or principal? Yeah, I, well, again, I think the charter school directors are much more focused as our um, private school leaders in finding resources for their school. Mm -hmm. as, as the principal at Farrington, um, I looked for resources to some extent, but I knew where to go. Our alumni, for example, were great, you know, helped us a great deal. We had some grants, we had different community partners, but I didn't have to worry about getting a construction loan and where am I gonna get the resources to, to mm -hmm. do that. Um, so we see some very entrepreneurial um, folks that are leading schools or who are participating on the boards of these charters. So every school has their own um, board and they hire the teachers, they hire the administrators. While the teachers are in the union, they have one-year contracts. They don't have tenure. And so that is one thing that is different. They, the pay is the same, but they don't have job guarantees. Mm -hmm. So they can hire and uh, remove people a little bit more adeptly than people who are in the regular public school system. But if you're, if you're a tenured teacher in the DOE and you decide to go work for a charter, you more or less can come back to the DOE in some respects. You, you come back, you would have to apply for a yeah. job and get the job in order to get your tenure back. Yeah. There's no return rights uh -huh. in the same way that if you take like a, a maternity leave or you mm -hmm. take leave for a year to go to school, you do have return rights. So you're chair of this commission that sort of is an accountability oversight. Tell us about the commission. How many are there? Well, there, there are nine folks on the commission. Um, it's different from what it, the last three years now we have been um, 
in existence. Prior to that, there was a review panel for yes. charter schools, and there was an office staff connected to that. Um, the law changed, and whereas it used to be fairly easy to start a charter school, um, it is very hard now. You know, there, the criteria for starting a school um, are much stricter. And one of the reasons we have done this is because we feel it's much easier to sustain a school if, this, if getting established is, is harder, because it's really, really hard to sustain. And we've had examples of schools that are struggling and one that we've, we did have to close this year. Um, we do have an, one new school opening, but we haven't had a lot of schools opening. We have one, we've had, uh, we had one um, out on, in Wy uh, Waimanalo that is now in its second year, and then one that will open in Kotlin next year. Mm -hmm. um, but we do still have a lot of applicants, and people are, um, there is a great deal of interest in starting charters. And didn't Laupahoehoe kind of Converse. Yes, yes, that was a conversion. That was our, our last conversion. That, uh -huh. uh, just the, and that was still un, when um, the uh, review panel was, yes, was yes. there. Um, the role, too, of the commission and the commission staff changed with the law. Um, previously, I think there was more just operational support for schools, and our job is in the law is, is to monitor the schools, to start schools, mm -hmm. to allow, to monitor them, and to close schools. Those are the three main things in the law. But the reality is, because there really is no other support system for schools, mm -hmm. we, we do a lot of that too, yeah. but it's not the main mission of the program. In, in some ways, the Charter Commission is compliance driven yes. to some extent, but I've also heard that the DOE districts in, in complex areas have also, in recent years, decades even, become more compliance, accountability, rather than supportive. Yes, I think that you will hear that from DOE folks too, <laughs> that there has been this great movement of accountability, largely politically driven from the, great, the wider community. Um, and I think a lot of us in education don't have a problem with accountability. We feel, you know, we're public servants, public employees. We need to be accountable. But there is lack of clarity sometimes of what that means mm -hmm. and uneven application from even supervisors and, you know, what, what, does that, what does that mean? And I think we're still trying to struggle through that. It should mean more than test scores. And um, right now that's pretty much it. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> so. I guess you count what doesn't count. <laughs> well, it, it certainly that's, that's that a sliver, to, yeah, and you know, there's so many other things, but other kinds of evaluations are more expensive. You yes. know, when you try to do more qualitative evaluations of children, it's, it costs more, but they certainly are more valuable um, tools. I, I worry a great deal, and, and one of the things the charters are trying to, not to do that I appreciate so much is that they're looking at the whole child. Yes. And I, I worry that we are, in, in our regular public education program, focusing so much on what we test that we are missing out on the arts and we're missing out yes. on physical education and things that are so important to the whole person as mm -hmm. we move forward. Yeah. But uh, especially poor children, you know, yeah. that might cause because they're not getting extra music lessons and things from their parents' um, pockets that, that kids in more affluent communities can. And, and today on the web there was a new report nationally on charters that seems to show that they, they help the poorer children better, maybe because smaller schools, more attention. Well, we're talking with Catherine Payne, who has been a principal in the DOE and is now chair of the Charter School Commission. We'll be back in one minute. This is Alice Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. ThinkTech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island in the ER position. 
Every other Tuesday, I get to host a show here on the Think Tech program about healthcare. We call it Healthcare in Hawaii. It's really enjoyable for me to bring other healthcare leaders from around the state to talk about our pressing issues. Hawaii has long been the health state, but we need to keep up the momentum, the inertia, and with your help and with your participation, we can come and share all of the big issues that are pressing day to day. Thanks for joining us every Tuesday, alternating weeks from 2 to 2.45. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, Reformers. We're talking with Catherine Payne, who is now the chair of the Charter School Commission, a commission of nine members who deal with compliance and accountability and herding the rabbits, if you want, of these independent <laughs> charter schools. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about um, a kind of movement that's been started with a, a, another group of Randy Roth and others focusing on what they're saying is school empowerment. And you were probably there when Charlie Taguchi was trying to decentralize more powers to uh, the schools and it keeps coming back again and again and again. Uh, and yet you have this charter model where there's true governance mm -hmm. uh, and you have a school community council in the DOE, which the DOE says very explicitly, you are not involved in governance. You know. uh, so you have any thoughts on, on, on where this whole issue is of school level decision making? It is kind of like uh, we've been <laughs> we've been down this road several yeah. times, and I um, met recently with Charlie Taguchi about Keho, which yes. was the the word that you know, the restructuring that he attempted to Im implement. And I remember going through that back when I was at Olamana. And if you look at the Keho document today, almost everything in it reflects what we're talking about That's now right. when That's we right. talk about school empowerment. So we actually have the document that mm -hmm. gives the roadmap to um, devolve a lot of the resources to the school. Um, and there are many models now across the United States that have successfully done this, and in Canada too. And so mm -hmm. one of the things the Education Institute has done is taken a trip and visited some of these sites in Edmonton, Canada, and in Los Angeles and in Nevada. And so we're not trying to come up with anything that's really Were, were new. you on that trip? I was not on the trip, but oh. I am on the board. Oh, and okay. so okay. I'm very familiar with people who were on the trip, and mm -hmm. I do um, have some experience trying to work within the, the system of putting more power into the schools, because when I was principal then at Farrington, we also went through the legislature passed the law that was supposed to put more, me more resources at the school Act level. Act 51. Act right? 51, and yes. so some of that was implemented, and I really felt as a principal that I was empowered to do a lot of things. Um, you can be, you're only as empowered though as the people who supervise you allow you to be. That's right. And so I, I was very fortunate in that I was allowed to do some creative things with our schedule at Farrington. A lot of the resources did come to the school through the weighted student formula. And um, so we were, we had a lot of flexibility in deciding as a school where we were going to put our resources. I think when I, shortly after I left is when things began to change again because of the federal oversight and the concerns that the state had with um, making sure that we met some of, mm -hmm. more um, robustly the standards that the federal government put into place. And so things began to change and schools were, began to be told how they had to spend their money. Yes. And that, that's something that concerns me. You know, I think the desire of the Board of Ed and others to have a successful system leads one to, let us say, trust the folks at the school level less. That's true. Yeah. But you don't have a successful, sustainable system when you over, your oversight is so strong that when you stop doing that, people just don't know what to do. Yeah. And so you're not developing leaders when you are so tightly controlling them that they no longer make good decisions themselves. They just wait to be told what to do. Why do you think there is this kind of almost structural, we know best at the top, you know, just listen to us, we'll tell you what to do. 
what is it about the culture? Is it the culture of public ed in general? Is it Hawaii? Uh, you have any thoughts on, on why we, we so love <laughs> to dictate from the top? <laughs> yeah, I, I think you know, there are probably many, many reasons for that. And I, we, we, it's, education is, like other things, is a pendulum that swings back and forth. Right. And right now we're in this time where accountability trumps everything else. And so yeah. when you're in a system like that, then the people at the top try to figure out how to make accountability work as opposed to how to make education work mm -hmm. or whatever the system they're overseeing works. And I think it, you just get caught up in it and you forget that you're there to serve children. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's really the purpose of everybody in the education department, whether they are working at, you know, in the technology office at the state, their job is still how is what I'm doing supporting children? Mm -hmm. If they're in personnel, how is what I'm doing supporting children? And I think that question needs to be asked every day by everybody who walks mm -hmm. into that building. In the charter system, uh, for every student who walks in the door, X amount of money goes to the school. That's correct. Uh, and uh, uh, as you have noted, and many others have, and we have at the Hawaii Educational Policy Center done review of the inequity of funding, right? Uh, some people have suggested maybe the, even the DOE should be funded on a per pupil basis and then whatever funds they, they have over and above teachers, they could pay the district folks to be servants of them versus <laughs> the other way around. Do you think a, a per pupil system across the board would work in the DOE? I think it would have a lot of complications it's something yeah. I would love to have a discussion about that yeah. I do think though um, <laughs> some kids cost more than other kids <laughs> that's right, so yeah. that's why the weighted student that's formula right, was, right, yeah. was valuable because you do have children that require mm -hmm. additional services mm -hmm. and for example at Farrington we had students who were heavily weighted because we had students who were disadvantaged we had students who did not speak English so mm -hmm. all of those things added to how much we got so if, right. if it's continued if it's that way um, I think that would be open to some positive discussion. I think any time we try to do anything that's just across the board, everything is equal, then you, you have problems with equity. You know, yes. equality is not equity. And that's so right, I, yeah. and there are no simple answers. You know, we really have to look at what, what is needed for these children. And if we have to fill in more because they come from less, then we need more resources to do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, the, Looking at the charter system, and, and, and you mentioned entrepreneurial, you know, out of just survival needed, yeah. right? And looking at the DOE, which has its own strengths and sustainability, do you see areas where, for example, the DOE could learn some things from the charters or vice versa? Well, you know, one of the purposes of our charter schools is to be laboratories yeah. that try things out that could be then mm -hmm. useful to the department. And so, yes, there are things. And one of the exciting things we're starting this coming year is we are opening some preschools. Um, we're opening four. We got a federal grant to do that because the Department of Education was offered the opportunity to apply for the federal preschool grant, and it was just too much for them to take on. Mm -hmm. So the charter school mm -hmm. office did that. And so we are actually starting some laboratory um, examples all on the big island because we picked mm -hmm. places where there is a shortage of preschool education um, I personally believe that this is critical that our ed public education ought to start with four years old because mm -hmm. children are coming to school behind and it's so hard to catch them up and so we're hoping this will be one example where the department will say mm, they can do it maybe we can too well the the preschools though even though they're part of your kuleana, your area of charterness, right? They're still regulated, not by the DOE or, or by the Board of Ed, right? They're regulated as preschools are. Yes. In, the, in a completely different department, oriented towards safety and, you know, filter out the, you know, criminal checks for people who work. We have to that. do that in the Department of yeah. Education, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yes, and I, but I think, you know, when we look at education as a, 
as what should be available through mm -hmm. public education. It's a continuum that should start as early as as we possibly can and then move forward to the now through, with, yeah. with this grant, right, uh, for preschools, would the teachers in the preschools be part of collective bargaining, Unit 5, or are they going to be kind of separate like most of the preschool uh, no, they, they will be part, they will be hired by the charter schools as public school public teachers. Public school teachers. Um, in the same way that, for Lena Puni is one example within the public school. They did get some mm -hmm. funding to have, and they have, they serve as children only who are in that um, uh -huh. community, but they do have a, a pre-K and a K. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. their pre-K teachers are public school teachers. So when this grant is out, when it's done, what happens then? Well. It's um, something that we have to talk about throughout this time because we, we'll be expanding to 18 classrooms over the life of the grant. Mm -hmm. And along with that will be parallel discussions on sustainability. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did want to ask a little bit about online education. We do have some virtual charter schools. They're actually kind of melded a little bit. But um, where do, you, do you see that as a growing trend? I see those schools have quite a lot of students. There are two, um, many of our charter schools have sort of subsets of students who are partially um, online. But uh, Kate, uh, the Hawaii Technology Academy and Myron B. Thompson have um, all of their students partially online. And there is a great interest. Many of the students coming into those schools had been homeschooled. Yes. You know, so that homeschool population, it's, it's easier to homeschool a child when they're really young. But when, as they get into high school, um, sometimes the depth of the curriculum requires more. And so there is a great interest in that population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it will continue to grow because the children of now are so much more adept at mm -hmm. online. There still needs to be that teacher contact, though, you know, oh, for I, most I, kids. I, I really totally believe, you know, and, and also the home environment has to be good enough where there's a quiet place. Yes. You know, if you have a huge family and dogs and cats and, and television is yes. on, you know, maybe that doesn't work so well. Uh, yes. So I always thought there should be a kind of evaluation of, of the home environment for some of them. Well, and they do require... Um, that there be somebody at home. For the students who are completely online, there needs to be somebody at home who can support them. And uh -huh. so that is part of the decision-making process about whether that will work or whether they need to be more in the hybrid where they come to school yes. part of the time. Yeah. Well, this is a fascinating discussion about what strengths and, and opportunities there are in the charter world and, and how the DOE might take a closer look at some of that. Uh, you're right, they're supposed to be incubators of innovation and choice. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it, it's a wonderful thing that the commission is willing and able to push that envelope to uh, look at what's coming down the road in the future. We've been talking with Catherine Payne, who is chair of the Charter School Commission, but long-term principal of a DOE school. Uh, there are two systems. Maybe they'll come together in the future. Thank you very much for joining us. Next week, we'll be talking with another principal who worked with the community to create a completely different public high school. Aloha.